So uh, what we are going to try to do to, uh, today, basically, I have two talks which are related to each other. And uh, they are related to basically safety and quality of treatment. So the first uh, part, which uh, I'm going to try to cover now, is uh, the issue of accidents and incidents and so and really what do we learn from that if we learned anything so the first question for me for you uh, is any of these things apply to you did you happen to hear something that happened in somewhere in the world i mean about radiation therapy something that concerns you or you would like to learn anything about it? Or did you in your department have a discussion and say you need to improve on something? Or your clinic is about to start a new treatment and you are concerned about it or not worried about that, maybe you don't care about it. Or somebody told you that you have to prepare you know, a new type of treatment or an inspection perhaps. Um, anybody of you made an error in, in your career in radiation therapy? One, two, three, four, five. Come on, don't be shy. Five, okay. And the rest, you just don't want to admit to it or you just didn't do, or you didn't do it long enough. Um, or maybe, I mean, in your hospital, I mean, you're, chief of the, of the hospital, the medical director, your boss, or somebody else, I mean, says, well, we heard that something like this happened somewhere and it better not happen to you. Any of you had something like this happen to you? No, yeah? Not, or we were told that and so on. So there is a, a number of reasons why we are talking about this, basically. And each one of us may have one or two main motivations why to discuss this. So I want to tell you a story, OK? Maybe a couple of stories, basically. Um, once upon a time, radiotherapy accidents or incidents were so rare and far between that we basically didn't hear about them. And when we heard about anything happening somewhere in the world, okay, we always thought that, we'll, well, is that all far away? I mean, except uh, for Santiago that knows that this is in La Pampa, in Argentina. I mean, for you, it may be like on the other side of the, of the globe altogether. And usually the circumstances were very unique, something very special that happened. I mean, so we were very surprised about what happened, but we say, well, that doesn't apply to us. I mean, it's, in, in our circumstances, this is not going to happen, okay? Except that in reality, that was rarely the truth because they were usually for every accident that we know about they have been something similar happen either somewhere else or even in the same place many times. And so why do we talk about this now? Why should we talk about this now and not, you know, a long time ago? Well, uh, in many, for many years, medical physicists were working incognito. Hardly anybody knew about what medical physicists is. Uh, even people in our hospitals didn't know what medical physicists do. Is that right? Um, and all of a sudden, I mean, a few years ago, uh, not too long ago, we became famous. I mean, the lights turned on, shining on us. I mean, you know, we were just becoming, everybody knew about medical physicists. Why? because there was a series of articles in the New York Times, started in the New York Times uh, in, nine, in 2010, so it's only about five years ago. And this Walt Bogdanovich is an excellent reporter, and he did a series of articles in the New York Times that became national attention, not only in the United States, but everywhere in the world, basically. 
Uh, any of you didn't hear about this? Yeah. This art series of articles? Really? Oh, I'm surprised because, I mean, everybody I, I talk to, I mean, knows about the articles in the New York Times. Well, I mean, the story is that uh, in an institution, only a subway right away from where I live, very respectable institution with a lot of medical physicists, board certified and so on, they had an accident where this man was being treated for head and neck cancer and basically a terrible accident happened and he was killed basically by this, okay? They were treating him with IMRT, they left the uh, MLCs open, they didn't, they, there was a problem in the QA they changed the plan, they didn't do the QA immediately, they did the QA, it didn't turn out right. They said, well, we'll do it next day, it was the end of the week. So they said, well, we'll repeat it on Monday. Uh, when they repeated, the, the results were bad. They said, well, well, we'll look into that further. By the time they looked into that again and found that there was a problem, the patient was treated three fractions uh, with I, supposedly IMRT, but the MLCs were totally open. So they give the, you know, 10 times the dose in an area much bigger than intended. The result is that the patient was, died, you know, sometime later. So this is what started it. But two days after the first article, he writes another article in the New York Times, and he talks about medical physicists. They check the equipment, but who checks on them? Who, is, who knows what they are doing? You know, maybe they are just don't know what they are doing. Well, it turns out that the medical physicists involved were very serious medical physicists, well-trained, very responsible, but there were a series of circumstances why this happened, okay? So, as part of that series, Walt Bogdanich went into the state records of New York State and put a series of reports or took some information about different cases that happened in New York State. I mean, after all, he lives in New York. And he, you know, this is the title of the article on January 24. New York State, the most stringent regulator, regulator of radioactive medical devices in, New York, in, the, in the United States. That's his statement. And he looked at the records in the state records of accidents and events that were reported to the state for a period from 2001 to 2009, about eight years. And he started reporting what were the things that were reported to the state. Well, let's go over a few of them just so you get an idea. Prostate gland misidentified, that's one of the cases. What happens? The ultrasound machine that they use for the ultrasound implants, for the ultrasound guided implants, was not performing very well. The vendor, did, they didn't have a consulting physicist to check the machine. The therapist that was helping the physician warned the physician that something doesn't look right about the shape of the prostate or something, okay? As a result, the place seeds, not in the prostate, or mostly not in the prostate. Okay, a patient treats, a, a therapist treats a patient on alternate dates, and it has to give two different treatments on alternate dates, made a mistake, okay? Two different treatments. A, the upper lung received one-tenth of the prescribed dose, and the uh, and the mediastinum goes 10 times the prescribed dose. Big mistake, yeah? Well, the patient died uh, time, sometime later. Radioactive seed implanted in the wrong location, similar to the one, that one. Um, what was the thing? They, he didn't interpret correctly the CT scan to verify where the seeds were located after the implant. That's typically part of the process. You implant them under ultrasound and then you take a CT to verify the position. A patient receives the wrong treatment. A, instead of treating patient A, they call patient B, maybe a similar last name, I don't know the circumstances. The dose that was the, supposed to be going to patient A was given to patient B. Um, 
radioactive seeds measured incorrectly. They made a mistake in measuring the activity of the seeds. The physicist or, and the radiation oncologist, they had not done a treatment plan in six years for Iridium-192. They didn't have cases. After six years, they have a case. They do it. They make a big mistake. They miscalibrate or misinterpret the calibration of the seeds. They irradiate the wrong part of the body. They had body marks on the patient. The therapist had some parameters, how to go perhaps from the marks to the correct place. You have the shift. You know, many of you do that. In, misinterpreted, probably there was a couch readout. The computer says, well, it's wrong. It says, don't mean, I know what I'm doing. Just override it, OK? Anybody heard about that? Happened to you? OK. Um, a computer is overreading again. The, oh, I'm sorry, that's the same slide. Uh, wrong body part being irradiated. The setup notes that were on the computer didn't correspond to the setup notes that were written on the chart. The radiation therapy had downloaded an older photograph for that patient was treated in a previous occasion. They put the wrong picture of the treated site in the computer, made a mistake. Uh, errors of radiation overdoses. A therapist forgot to put a wedge on the machine. They treated without the wedge. They, they, got a, they had some monitoring device, but they ignored the readout on the monitoring device. The therapist didn't inform neither the physician or the physicist that were involved. Uh, why? Well, they didn't have a physicist full time. The physicist was maybe one day a week, 20% of his time. So they just, well, the phys physicist is not there. They just will tell him maybe next week or not. Um, a patient was treated for breast cancer, and it got 50% overdose, over 10 treatments. Again, they left a wedge out. The physicist didn't do the first weekly check. The hospital had problems with staffing. Temporary works were coming, I mean, to covering for others. They were not familiar with the, with the treatment routines, procedures, error. Again, a wrong patient treated. I'm going just to go that because, I mean, you know, a lot of these, as you can see, are very repeated events, I mean, similar events. A patient was, uh, a, an old man was treated for the esophagus, was supposed to be treated twice daily. A physics, dosimetry, and, ther and, and the therapist, they all failed to catch an error. The state inspection came after the fact because they had to report it to the state. The state inspects, sends an inspector to investigate. Well, they were understaffed. There was not enough staff to cover everything. A computer error was not spotted. Look at the, read what this says. This is the, from the official record. A patient in his 40s got massive overdose of radiation to his brain because the device that shaped and modulated the beam was mistakenly left open, okay? A physicist didn't double check after, until the treatment and the, this, the error was displayed on the treatment screen, but two therapists, didn't notice it. What do you read from this? This is the case. This is this case. From reading that, I would never imagine that this is what, that, that this was the case involved. OK? You cannot understand what that report means, really. Correct? Well, more cases. Again, a, left, a wedge was left out. The therapist didn't notice. The computer showed that the wedge, the wedge was missing. They overrode the great things. So this is the summary of what came out on this, from this uh, article on New York State mistakes. And over this period of nine years, or eight years, I'm sorry, there were 621 radiation mistakes reported. It's interesting to notice that there were a total 
of these are the different causes. I mean, after every case that is reported, you try to identify what, are the, what were the problems, what were the reasons. And there is essentially double the number of reasons than the number of mistakes. So on average, there is at least two reasons for any mistake that happened. OK? Well, this is New York State. Now, New York State, in 2001, enacted a law that requires every medical physicist to have a license to practice medical physics, the same thing as a radiation therapist or a doctor. And this is one of four states in all the United States that requires a license. I don't know about any country that requires a license. There are some regulations that say if in order to do A, B, and C, you have to have board certification, you have to pass a course, etc. But to have a license means that if you do malpractice or you do something which is against the code of ethics of your profession, your license can be taken away. Okay? If you drive a tractor or a, a, a trailer, a, a, tr a truck, a trailer truck on the highway and you just have an accident and it turns out that you were drunk while you were driving, they will take your license away. You cannot drive anymore for, or you cannot drive for five years or something. And so New York State, in that particular period of time, probably have more reported cases than many other places where this, you are not licensed. I know that if I had something happen to us, I would make sure that I report it. Because if they find that I didn't report it, I lost my license. I lost my job. OK? So let's talk about a couple of you know, concept, conceptual beliefs. We start saying that usually accidents in radiotherapy are very rare. And I think they are rare. It's perhaps true. The majority. You know, people think that the majority happened long time ago in the developing world, in the underdeveloping world. I mean, any, any excuse, all kind of reasons. And sometimes people say, well, it's linked for the low technology equipment. It's not sophisticated enough. Others say, well, it's the high technology equipment that causes accident. It's too complicated. People don't know how to use it. Well, I want to go back because I have a series of articles that appeared in the Ohio um, Plain Dealer. It's a paper, not as famous as the New York Times, but in 1992, uh, how many years that is? It's almost 10 years before the New York Times. No, I'm sorry, almost 20 years before that series of New York Times. The Plain Dealer published a series of accidents you know, 20 years before. There was a big uproar, and look at the titles. Dangerous medicine, deadly mistakes, people were killed. So very you know, high profile report. Um, I want to just go to a couple of these, because these are the subtitles on the different parts. 40 people killed, and the NRC doesn't know it. NRC is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States. It regulates radioactive materials. Cobalt units, HDRs, LDRs, etc. Doesn't regulate linear accelerators. It's a federal agency. The linear accelerators are regulated by the states, some more, some less. So there were a couple of things published in that series. And you know, look at the subtitles: human tragedies, the officials cover up, the government is not doing their job, etc. Lies. People are convicted or are not convicted, and they, nobody goes to jail. And there were hearings in Congress. The, you know, after this series, people were in Congress saying, well, something has to be done. And there were decisions. They will set up a commission. We'll do this. Exactly the same after the New York Times. OK? Well, I want to just cover two accidents that were reported in that, that series. Does any of you heard, because I'm sure that most of us were not even born in 1974, um, at least the majority of us, uh, of an accident in Riverside, Ohio, the uh, Ohio plane dealer, I mean, wanted to obviously cover that accident. That was, goes back to 74. 
years before I even go, went into medical physics. I think you probably didn't go into medical physics. No? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. So what was the accident in Riverside, Ohio? Okay, first of all, don't expect to see anything you know, fancy or thing like that. It happened with a cobalt unit. Uh, you saw this picture on Monday, okay? A cobalt unit, very simple, simple mechanism. You know, the dosimetry, we went through that on Monday. Um, what happens with that cobalt unit? They had a physicist for many years there, old timer, he knew these routines, he had his own equipment, etc. New administration came, they decided to bring a new physicist on board, they hired a physicist, Joel Axt, which had a PhD in physics, and he had a small amount of training, I think, in California. They brought him to Ohio. He's the new guy on the block because they were going to install a linear accelerator, one of the earliest ones. And the previous medical physicist, Callendine, George Callendine, George Callendine, was it? George, George yeah. Um, he had a long reputation, but apparently there was no good communication between the two. He, the new one came to basically take his job away. Um, so, cobalt unit, this is, the this is the dosimetry planning system, if you want. And we talked about this on Monday. Everything depends on this output. The output, 100 centigrade per or how many centigrade per minute you get from the machine. So everything revolves at, around that number. And that number obviously will change with the half-life of the cobalt unit. And you can basically calculate it from, you know, with your calculator or your graph. So in order to save time, he was just plotting the output of the machine every month as a function of, of the date on a semi-log paper. You know, it's a straight line on a semi-log paper. But then, after he got to July 73, he ran out of semi-log paper, and he continued his plot on linear paper. OK? Well, I mean, at the beginning, nothing happens, because, I mean, the change is so slow that it doesn't quite make a difference. But after several months or after a year, the two curves started diverging. So his output was calculated to be so much, but in reality was increasing and increasing and increasing in relation to his calculation. Well, the physician that was relatively new came to the hospital because they were about to install a linear accelerator, and they started looking. I mean, they were still doing mostly of the patient's cobalt, and he discovered and he felt that he was getting too many side effects from, for his patients, too many complications. At the beginning, I mean, there was nothing you know, to be alarmed. And asked because he was so busy trying to plan for the accelerator that this cobalt was something so simple, okay, so trivial, that he just forgot or didn't forget, but he didn't do his monthly output checks. So you were just relying on that graph paper, just that. OK, well, for about seven, 27 months, more than two years, he didn't put a chamber to check his output. Initially, he says, well, he had a problem with equipment and so on. And, but you know, he had a higher priority to put a new linear accelerator and look into all the things. And it was new technology. So, so when the physician started seeing that there were clinical problems, with his patients, he, start, he confronted tax and says, you know, are you sure that the output is okay? So he gave some excuse. Finally, he got very upset. He says, I want you to put a meter under the machine to verify the output. Okay, he put the meter. It turns out that the machine was producing about 30% more than calculated or something like that. Initially, he didn't, but at the end, when he was confronted, he admitted that not only he made a mistake, but he also covered it up. He was not honest about it. There were 
reports, they had to report it to the authorities, it was cobalt, it wasn't an accelerator, so the NRC needed to be notified, and they just issue a fine. Nobody was given a big trouble, I don't remember what the fine was, but the director of the radiation oncology group, the new physician, that had to face all this inquiry from, the, from his hospital, from the NRC and so on, the day that he reported, he died of a heart attack. He was 37 years old. Full coincidence. I don't think it's all related at all. Okay? It's po possibly that it's nothing to relate, but I mean, so, so this is the case that, um, now, when they looked into that, they found that there were 28 patients that died of overdoses over the period of years. Some of them were not reported as a consequence of the overdose. For instance, a woman had a problem in her shoulder. She got her shoulder almost frozen. She was driving. She got into a car accident after the treatments, maybe a year or two years after the treatment. She didn't die from overdose. She died from a car accident, so it wasn't reported as a result of, a, of an overdose. Okay? So there were a number of cases. These reporters went there and looked at this. Uh, under the U ne Nuclear Regulatory Commission reports, there were only two people that were reported as dying from, from that accident. These reporters find about 26. So who was, who was at fault here at Riverside? OK? Asked the new physicist, it's obvious. Yeah? You, you all agree? Yeah. He, he was really at fault. However, this was not his own fault, only fault. There was a team effort that made this happen. A lot of people contributed to that. The administration hired unqualified staff because he was not really qualified to do radiation therapy. Uh, there were conflicting priorities on the workload, the new LINAC versus the routine work, the stuff that is not so important. Okay? Not enough staff, obviously, to do everything, to do one and the other. There were no external audits. There was nobody checking that the output of the machine independently was checked. There were no internal audits and there were no external audits. And there were not external audits about the complications, the clinical complications, not only about the dosimetry. And there were no review or peer review of the mortalities or the complications until you know, something really got out of hand. And obviously, there was not a very good quality control program because they were not using redundancy methods to check things. What would be the redundancy method in the case of the machine output? Huh? Speak up. Well, either two people to check the output, to do the, the calculation instead of with the graph paper, or somebody, or just putting the chamber. That's a redundancy method. You calculate and you measure. All right? So, uh, the physician also ignored clinical signs until it really became obvious. This was one case in that series of reports. There is another case in which I want to just spend a little bit of time and uh, how much time do I have, uh, Renato? Five That's all? Okay, time flies. Okay. Uh, okay, well, I'll try to go over this rel relatively quickly. A, a, K, a center in Tyler, in, K, in, in Texas, there were four centers in Texas, in um, Georgia, in Canada, and in, um, in Washington State diverse places in the United States, were using a Terac 25 linear accelerator. Any of you heard about the Terac 25 accident? Colin heard. I heard. <laughs> you did? No? Well, I'm surprised because the Terac 25 accident became a, a poster case for bad engineering process. Not bad engineering, the bad engineering process. As a matter of fact, all this that I'm going to tell you about, it's published and you can download it for free. I mean, there is a woman in Boston, I believe, either at MIT or some place, published a big report on 
all the process, all the things that happened there, what happened, what didn't happen, what should have been happening in the design and the fabrication of this linear accelerator. The company that fabricated this machine is ACL, Atomic Energy of Canada, and now it's been pri privatized. But at the time, it was one of the most advanced linear accelerator designs. It was a high energy machine with independent jaws, with uh, electrons, photons, you could do a lot of things with it. Uh, I worked with the Terac 20, which was before this computerized design. So it was semi-computerized. But there were six massive overdoses over a period of more than two years. More than two years. And it was considered the worst radiation accidents in the history of medical accelerators until that point. You can look at that. This is one of the cases reported. It's a series of articles uh, the IAA has published accident reports for many years. This is one of them, and it's included. I believe, I'm sorry, I think this is not in this one, but uh, you can download it. It's a case study of major accidental exposures, and you can go to this site and download it. But basically what happens is the following. In the, in the head of the linear accelerator, you have... For photons, you have the, the target. Under the target, you have a flattening filter. Now you have some machines that are flattening field, uh, filter free. Okay, but that's much, much more modern. And then you have the primary collimator and you have the, the jaws. When you try to treat with electrons, you have the bending magnet, but the target, which is here, is taken away. And instead of that, you have a monitoring chamber, and you have the diaphragm, and basically the collimator trimmers to, to fix the field close to the patient. In the design of the machine, there is what's called a carousel. It's like a plate that has either the flattening filter or a scattering foil or other devices that will move around depending on what mode of treatment you select. If you treat electrons, if you treat photons, for electrons you will have different scattering foils. For, uh, even for uh, photons you may have different flattening filters. And there is some mechanism that will tell you is the correct piece in the right place before you can treat. Now, you have to remember, what is the electron beam current on the target in relation to the electron beam current when you treat with electrons? Any idea? I mean, you have the answer there, <laughs> okay? For photons, you, you use almost a thousand times more electrons hitting the target, okay? And you know the reason. First of all, a lot of that, the generation of photons is not very efficient. And second, you have then underneath, you have the flattening filter that it's going to attenuate the beam before it comes out. So you have to produce all this many more electrons hitting the target than you would use if you just didn't have the target and you treat with electrons per se. So a patient was treated with electrons for breast cancer, jumped out of the couch basically saying, you burn me when he was treated. Okay, well, even the technologists that went to the room felt that the area which was treated was warm, was too warm. Now, if any of you is trying to boil water for tea in a linear accelerator, you would know that <laughs> the, a linear accelerator on radiation is very inefficient hitting device, all right? So for something to raise the temperature of tissue so it can be felt, you know, you are talking about at least several, you know, five, ten degrees, which is many, many times more than what you would get the heat deposited in, 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 in an absorber. So there was a line of events, because the first time that this happened, they didn't know what happened. They knew that something was strange what happened, but they couldn't reproduce it. It went on, and there were different uh, communications between the their staff with the company ACL, they say they reported we had a problem. The answer from the company was, no, it's not possible. Never happened. It's designed that, you know, you cannot, it's impossible. What you describe is impossible. 
Uh, they, since they were not required, that was in Texas, and this was an accelerator, not in a, a, a radioactive machine. They didn't have to report it to the NRC. So there was no report. They didn't report it to the state, to the, to the, to the federal government. Uh, sometime later, in Ontario, Canada, they had another overdose with the same type of machine. And then they were suspecting that maybe a micro switch that tells where the carousel is failed. So they replaced the micro switch. They say, well, that everything is fine now. Uh, then there was a lawsuit against the ACL in December. I mean, like um, we are talking about half a year later, they had a abnormal skin reaction, severe abnormal skin reaction. And they reported that. I mean, they tried to think. They contacted ACL. Impossible. And no other accident like this occurred. So the company didn't even make, connect the two, the two cases. All right, just to make the things short, there was a malfunction error appearing on the computer, malfunction 54. Nobody understood what that meant. You know, nobody went to the books to try to interpret what malfunction 54 is. And ACL claimed that it's impossible. They never had something like this. They put back the machine in service. They had another overdose, and the physicist and the therapist managed to reproduce the error. Okay? What it involved is that the physicist, and I particularly, I'm not in the computer era, so I'm not too fast with my fingers. I would have gone and find the keys and so on. The therapist were so familiar with the machine. They were doing the things very, very fast, like ty blind typing. And when they were going from one mode, photons to electrons, okay, they were typing, and they selected the energy. There were two energies that had the same number. I think it was 16 MV and 16 MEV. And they changed from one to another too fast for the computer and the machine to react to that. So the machine went into an unknown state. That's what's called on, com on computer uh, design an undefined state, and it was able to think. So they were able to reproduce the error. They just found that the dose that they measured, they put a dosimeter, they put a dose that measured 4,000 times more than what they expected. And probably that was because their dosimeter under-responded because it was saturated. OK, so bottom line is that this case went on, and until they pulled up that machine off service in the old world. I mean, they say they need to go back to the uh, drawing board. But it took about two years to get this thing resolved. Two years. So these are the characteristics of the report, the carousel rotation, malfunction code. They, you can read all of that. And I suggest if you, you want to read a, a novel, Go read this, because this is really important. OK, so who was at fault here? Any idea? Whose fault was it? The manufacturer. OK, that's good. You probably saw my presentation before. <laughs> so ACL, obviously, was at fault because they designed a machine that was capable of doing something like this. However, again, this was a team effort. OK? The patient complaints were not investigated thoroughly. Thoroughly. They were investigated, but you know, they say, well, OK, we don't know. Uh, the clinical outcome didn't trigger a thorough investigation and inquiry. Three of the four clinics failed to investigate, really, until they found the problem. And the facility didn't assume the responsibility for what happened. They say, well, we call ACL. You know, they, they need to know. There were not regulations for reporting this type of error. And there was no communication between user groups. OK. I'm not going to go to all the rest of the things, because these are another s series of cases in that article. Um, but the mistakes were at institutions where were small, large, rural, academic. It didn't, 
it, the, the biggest thing was who reports and who doesn't report. And again, most of the cases were not accelerators because the NRC doesn't require them. Now, the key thing is these are the three reporters that wrote that series. So how difficult was for these reporters to find out about these cases? OK? Well, they filed more than 100 requests under the Freedom of Information Act. This is a federal law that allows you, as a private citizen, to request from the government that they open a file on something that you're, you're trying to get in, information. They filed more than 100 requests to get these things opened. Um, and they analyzed like a, a million and a half NRC records, OK? These are other cases which are not in that series. Cases that you may have heard, the IEA has given a lot of reports. These are cases that reported in the IEA. Oregon, in Spain, Costa Rica, Panama, France, anywhere you want. And these are the places where, report, where reports came out. So it obviously, it's a global issue. And both the IAEA and other world organizations have taken this very seriously. And there is a publication on prevention of accidental exposures in radiotherapy by the IAEA. I, ask, I would like you to download that and read it. Uh, and the World Health Organization recognizes that it's not just in radiation therapy. This is a, re, accidents in medicine are relatively common. So this is in accidents in general, not just in medicine. The IAA also published this analysis of the causes and contributing factors. So what did we learn from all this? First of all, that accidents happen. Okay. Uh, when they happen, there is more than one factor, you know, more than one reason in, in the thing. Uh, and the other thing which we didn't learn from here, but I will try to demonstrate that or show an indication of that, that there is more almost accidents than the real ones that get published. There is probably many, many, many more. And there are co some common factors. Some of them are related to training, communications, both internal within the institution, external between institutions. There are barriers. There are questions of authority. Who can question what is being done or what happens? Or perhaps the, the, the lack of authority to question. The lack of redundancies, distractions, numerous questions. You can read all of that. And the lack of clarity and analysis on reporting of what happened. Because if we want to learn of what happened, as you saw from even that New York, New York State report on the with the IMRT accident, you cannot learn anything from that report. I mean, that's almost useless for somebody else to learn the thing. So coming soon to this theater in the next hour, what can we do about this? OK? So we have coffee now, and I continue after that? or. Or you call, continue. Oh, okay. All right. So thank you for now. <laughs>